The start of the Women's World Cup this summer in Australia and New Zealand marks the pinnacle of football for women around the world. The growth of the women's game in the past 30 to 40 years has been seen with the World Cup growing in size and popularity with each iteration as the competition increases. The success of current and recent players to grow the game highlights the success, but also difficulties involved in developing women's sports. The phenomenon of women's sports is not recent, and the history of football reveals how women have had to fight for their position and that national football associations worked to keep women out of the sport. In this talk, we will go over a brief history of women's football to track its rise, suppression, and then rise over time. Playing football was never limited to just men and the development of organized football first in England and then around the world was directed at men. The creation of rules surrounding the playing of football in the middle of the 19th century was done by school headmasters in England as a way to direct their male students' energies in productive ways. The playing of football helped students become physically active, countering the degradation of industrial society and helped teach them important lessons about life teamwork and hard work. The Football Association, the FA, that created the modern rules for football in 1863 were all students at these schools and they sought to continue playing the games they loved when they were students. The public schools of England that cultivated the game and spread it to the masses and the world were focused on developing male bodies and minds with football. The spread of football to the rest of society meant women were exposed to the game and took an interest in it. Early organized games by women were often charity or pickup games, rather than league or tournaments like the FA Cup played by men. The men in charge of the game in the 19th century were generally opposed to women playing, believing the violence of the game made it inappropriate for women. The rules that removed physical tackling made it difficult to defend their positions as women highlighted that physical contact was both discouraged and illegal in the game now. The fear of social degradation by industrialization helped women as they argued they, like men, needed to be physically fit and to exercise. Playing sports was beneficial for everyone to keep society strong. The development of the first women's teams and attempts to form leagues began at the end of the 19th century and happened hand in hand with the rise of women's suffrage debates. As women protested their lack of political rights in society, the playing of sports was also used as an example of the inequalities in society. Forming ladies leagues and teams during this point in time was a protest towards the patriarchy that denied them space in many areas of society. These early women's teams and players were dominated by members of the middle and upper classes. The number of players was limited as most women were unable to play. Playing sports required time, wealth, and the ability to interact with large groups of other women to form a team. It was the arrival of the First World War that changed women's football and saw it rise to new heights of importance and popularity. The war gave women's football the opportunity to grow due to several reasons. One was the lack of high quality of a high quality men's game, the congregation of large groups of financially stable women, and the investment from businesses to create teams, tournaments, and competitions. The decline of the men's game was not something driven by women, but as a byproduct of the war enthusiasm. The outbreak of the war in the summer of 1914 came just before the new season was to begin. Across Europe, the call to serve went out and men were expected to report for duty in the armed forces. In England, the professional football clubs were reluctant to let their players go to war. A new season was about to begin and they needed them to play to make money. Unlike other sports competitions, the 1914-15 season went ahead, even though large numbers of footballers had volunteered to serve. The FA and the clubs received significant flack from the government and the press for continuing to play. The perception was that football was unpatriotic and only concerned with making money. Football players were seen as cowards 
and shirking their duty to the nation. Due to the significant amount of bad press, the season finished, but they chose not to continue next season. Clubs attempted to fix their reputation by hosting charity matches to raise funds for local hospitals, the Red Cross, or to help raise morale amongst war industries and the troops. Other sports, particularly rugby, attacked football and made sure to remind the public after the war that they were slow to respond and that football was not patriotic. These were attempts to lure away fans from football, which was the most popular sport in England. For women, the lack of a men's game left them with a large opening. The home front, particularly the working class, that remained working in factories or on farms supporting the war effort, were starved for entertainment during the war. The charity matches were often, but were often not frequent enough, while fans and critics complained that the quality was not great as the teams were often made up of retired players unable to serve or youths too young to enlist. As a result, fans and the public were craving high quality football that was first and foremost entertaining. One of the barriers to organizing women's football before the war was the difficulty in finding large pools of players who were financially stable to be able to play. The heavy recruitment of men into the armed forces meant that industries, factories, and farms became desperate for labor. Rules and restrictions surrounding the hiring of women were relaxed, and the mass recruitment of women into, into skilled factory work ensued. Factories and industry have played an important role in the development of national sports around the world, as it was through factory teams that sports were transferred from being a purely middle and upper class pastime to the masses of society. Football's growth to become the most popular sport in Britain and other European nations was due to the rise of factory teams of working class players who turned the sport professional bringing their factory and local fan bases with them. As women had been denied large-scale employment in these factories before the war, women's teams had been dominated by the higher strata of society. With the congregation of working-class women in factories, with stable incomes and free time after their shifts, the opportunity to grow the women's game was there. The growth of factory teams began between workers, looking for something to keep them entertained after work and grew over time. Charity matches began to form as the factory teams played each other to raise funds for the war effort. The quality of play became clear to everyone watching as the women's teams provided entertaining and competitive games. More teams from factories formed and in 1917 saw the formation of a league. The Munitionettes Cup was created in August 1917, and teams across England played for the Cup. The first final was played in May 1918, with a crowd of over 22,000 watching the Blythe Spartans defeat the Bolko Vaughan. It ran again in 1918-19, with Palmer Shipyard of Hepburn on Tyne defeating Hartlepool in a game hosted by St. James Park in Newcastle which is home to the current Newcastle United FC. The development of the women's game was pushed by leading businesses and factories who saw an opportunity to both garner goodwill from the public and make money in a sports venture. Factory owners and managers were at first leery about supporting women's football, but seeing the growing crowds and support for the game they seized on the opportunity to grow the sport. By supporting the growth of the game in charity matches, they were able to look benevolent to the public. And when leagues began, when league play began, they were able to cash in on ticket sales. The FA was particularly annoyed about this as the growth of the women's game happened outside of their purview and they received no money from their games. They were, however, reluctant to act while the war was ongoing. The most famous women's team from this era benefited from the patronage of their factory to help grow the game. The Dick Kerr Ladies FC. The Dick Kerr factory in Preston 
created their women's team in 1917, where they played many charity matches, drawing large crowds. The Dick Kerr ladies continued after the war with factory support as they recruited women from across Britain to join their team with the promise of factory jobs. They were able to form one of the best women's teams in history, dominating domestic and international games to help keep the sport alive. The decades from 1920 to 1940 saw the collapse of women's football across Europe as men's football organizations and governments cut women from the sport. It began in England with the end of the First World War. The end of the war saw the return of men from the front lines, and this meant that professional football resumed. More devastating was the British government's desire to return to the way society was before the war, and that meant moving women out of the factories and back to the homes. Women were laid off due to declining work and to make space for veterans. The Munitionettes Cup was unable to continue after 1919 as the number of teams drastically declined due to women being fired from their factory work. The Dick Kerr ladies survived thanks to their factory owners and managers keeping them employed and recruiting top footballers to join their team. Women's teams, though, were able to survive by barnstorming across the country. Charity matches remained popular, and with the financial struggles of Britain that was undergoing a recession with inadequate social services, the games proved popular ways to support fellow citizens in times of crisis. The high quality of play remained as the surviving teams were made up of the top talent recruited to keep playing. These barnstorming tours saw the game stay alive and grow as they began looking outside of Britain for opponents. In 1920, French activist Alice Milliant formed a national French team from the top players in Paris and set up a reciprocal tour with the Dick Kerr ladies. The tours saw four games each in Britain and France. To great success on both sides of the channel, as large crowds came out to see the tightly contested series. Milliat helped push for greater participation of women in sports, not just football, and is credited for ensuring the Olympics allowed women to have track and field events. It was the FA that moved to end women's football in England. The FA had approved of women playing in charity matches during the war. But as they developed into a league with the Munitionettes Cup, the FA felt threatened by them. The end of the war saw the return of men to football and resumption of professional leagues in the FA Cup in the 1919-20 season. Women's teams, like the Dick Kerr ladies, were able to attract similar and sometimes more fans to their games than the men. The FA Cup in 1921 saw only 50,000 fans attend, while in a charity match at the end of 1920, the Dick Kerr ladies had 53,000 fans in attendance. Seeing a threat to their dominance of the sport, the FA moved to limit the ability of women's teams to play. Using their allies in the press, the FA issued a ban in 1921 to all their member clubs forbidding them from allowing women's games of any kind to be played in their stadiums. The FA justified their actions by quoting several doctors who were opposed to women playing football, who argued that the game was dangerous to the health of women and society. The ban significantly impacted the ability of women's teams to attract large numbers of fans to their games. Women's teams were forced to play in smaller venues of lesser quality or on pitches not designed for football, like rugby grounds. The press degraded women playing the game, viewing them as rebels and socially dangerous with their refusal to follow conventions. In particular, fears were spread in the press that playing football promoted same-sex relationships in women threatening the social order and perceptions of women's roles in society. Limited by where they could play and the bad press, women's teams struggled to stay afloat. 
the Dick Kerr Ladies remained active, playing until 1965, though they had to change their name to the Preston Ladies FC in 1926 after the factory owners refused to keep the team going. While the men's game grew with increased coverage in radio and then television, the women's game remained underdeveloped and poorly attended by fans who either did not know it existed or did not care. Outside of England, the development of the women's game also experienced growing difficulties. Bans on women playing football grew during this period. The French Football Federation did not ban women at first, but it refused to let them join. The French Federation of Feminine Sports Societies instead organized football matches and tournaments. The French Football Federation tried to stop them in 1933 by issuing a ban, which was followed up in 1941 when the fascist Vichy government made it illegal for women to play football. While the law was rescinded after the war, the ban from 1933 remained in place. In Germany, Bans on women's football started in, under the Nazi regime and ended after the war. Bans were resurrected in West Germany in 1955, citing fears that the sport damaged the feminine image. In East Germany, no ban was instituted, but communist officials obstructed attempts to form teams and play games. The Franco government in Spain moved to ban women's football in 1939 after the left-wing republic had allowed the development of women's teams. In Brazil, women were banned from playing football by successive military regimes and dictatorships starting in 1941. The ban on women playing was enforced by Yahoo Havelange, who later became head of, the head of FIFA. In the meantime, the men's game started to grow by leaps and bounds as FIFA expanded the World Cup was started and continental competitions, with Europe being the biggest, commenced to great success and increased wealth. Football became a global game, but it was only allowing men to play. The resurrection of women's football was influenced like its original rise by external social forces that promoted the sport. While it was suffrage that helped push late 19th and early 20th century activists in football, it was the next wave of feminism and women's activism for social and political rights that saw the return of women's football. The global popularity of the sport by the 1960s appealed to women who saw it as a way to push for greater equality and end patriarchal systems in play. The success of men's World Cups to attract the national attention, with the 1966 World Cup in England, for example, made women able to seize on their own participation in the sport. Student movements and the larger push in both America and Europe for women's liberation and social equality helped promote women's sports as necessary to end part patriarchal rule. Attempts to revive the women's game were met with indifference and hostility from the organizers of the men's game. The first major push came from Italy, where the Federation of Italian Women's Football was founded in 1968. This independent women's football organization moved to create a part-time professional league in Italy for women and began advocating for the women's game across Europe. In 1969, they hosted the European Competition for Women's Football, the first such tournament in European history. Made up of only four teams, Italy, France, Denmark, and England, the tournament is considered an unofficial event as it was not hosted by UEFA or sanctioned by FIFA. In 1970, the Italians had formed the Federation of Independent European Female Football to help grow the game internationally. They hosted a World Cup in 1970 in Italy with more teams, including West Germany, Mexico, Switzerland, and Austria. The success of the unofficial 1970 World Cup was shocking to the men in charge of FIFA and UEFA who believed it would be of little importance. 
the success saw a second World Cup in 1971, this time hosted overseas in Mexico, and saw a pre-tournament qualification take place. Argentina played for the first time in the tournament, with the final seeing the largest crowd to watch a women's game, with over 110,000 people in the Azteca Stadium in Mexico City to see Denmark defeat the host Mexico to win the tournament. Witnessing the rapid growth of women's football, many national organizations moved to try and control the women's game. Bans on women's game ended in both France and Germany in 1970, as both nations wanted to ensure that all aspects of the game were under their control. UEFA had pushed for a suppression of these independent women's tournaments, which some countries took more seriously than others. East Germany stated that women's football teams were ineligible for funding in 1969, halting any hope of promoting the game there. The Soviet Union moved to officially ban women's football after complaints in 1972, while the Spanish worked to repress the game, reminding society of the ban in 1971 and then crushing the attempts to host the 1972 Women's World Cup in Spain. UEFA though changed tactics, seeing that the growing women's game should be under their control and in 1971 voted to recognize women's football. The move ended the Federation of Independent European Female Football and saw women's football come under men once more. Progress in growing the game outside of Europe saw women push for football like the Europeans. Growing popularity of the game in Asia, as well as in Australia and New Zealand, saw the Asian Football Confederation create the AFC Women's Championship in 1975. This championship is the oldest regional women's football tournament in the world. In the United States, this sport started to grow in the 1960s as football gained a new popularity thanks to it being a college sport. The game was promoted to women in the US as a less a violent alternative to more popular sports like American football. Universities and colleges were forced to give equal funding to women's varsity sports in 1972 following a court ruling. This encouraged more women in the US to participate in the sport as the National, National College Athletic Association administered large tournaments and leagues between college teams. The NCAA remains a key training ground for US women for the US women's national team as the programs that started during this time created a strong foundation for the future of US success in the sport. Progress though was slow as the men's organizations continue to drag their feet. Even though UEFA and many of its members ended bans on women's football and were starting to grow domestic leagues, international competitions and large-scale investment was slow. FIFA, headed by Brazilian Havelange, continued to resist women in the international game. Upset and tired at the slow progress, European women's federations came together to revive their own competition in 1979, playing an independent European championship in Italy. Consisting of 12 teams, the tournament saw Denmark defeat their hosts in the final before 15,000 fans in Naples. The tournament was a wake-up call for UEFA, who saw it as a challenge to their authority. Hearing the complaints and unwilling to let their control slip, UEFA announced the start of a women's competition in 1980, with the first tournament to be played in 1984. This tournament would later become the Women's Euros. FIFA remained unmoved by the changes. Seeking to advance the international game that was growing at this time, the Mundialito, Spanish for Little World Cup, was started in 1981 as an invitational tournament for women's teams. The first tournament was hosted by Japan, but it moved to Italy in the second iteration in 1984, where it remained a yearly event until 1988. In 1985, the Americans were invited to send a team, forming the first U.S. national women's team. 
They finished in last, but they returned the next year and finished second behind Italy. The growing popularity and competitive nature of the Mundialito, along with growing women's tournaments and leagues in Europe and Asia, forced FIFA to react. In 1986, Norwegian footballer Ellen Will became the first woman to speak at a FIFA Congress. Her speech lambasted the failure of FIFA to organize, promote, or support the growth of women's football around the world. She demanded better of the organization and that they do something to help grow the game. Seeing the success of the women's games in tournaments, FIFA finally relented to act. Rather than form a World Cup though, they created the FIFA Women's, Women's International Invitational Tournament to be played in China in 1988. The regional confederations were invited to send teams to the tournament that would act as a test for the feasibility of a World Cup. A total of 12 teams played, with Norway emerging victorious against Scandinavian rival Sweden. The tournament was deemed a success by FIFA, with attendance of all games averaging around 20,000. The success of the tournament was enough to convince FIFA to move forward with a Women's World Cup to start in 1991. The first official World Cup was again hosted by China and featured 12 teams. The American team took home the title, defeating Norway in the finals. The next World Cup in 1995 was hosted by Sweden and again was limited to only 12 teams. Norway was able to avenge their defeat and won, beating Germany in the finals. The tournament was seen as less successful as the average attendance was only 4,000 and the total number of fans to attend was only 112,000. It was the 1999 World Cup hosted by the US that changed the way the world looked at women's football. The Americans had targeted the tournament as a key for them. Their victory in 1991 had received a little fanfare back home to the disappointment of the players and staff. The success and popularity of the 1994 Men's World Cup hosted by the US saw football increase in popularity in the country as US soccer saw it as an opportunity to grow the game. The women saw their own World Cup as the same opportunity. FIFA though was cautious. They were unsure that the women's game could attract the same level of crowds as the men's game and so were reluctant to allow the Americans to play the games in larger stadiums. FIFA was worried that the optics would look would be bad of half empty stadiums on television. The Americans though refused to back down demanding to play in the larger stadiums the men had, believing that showcasing women's football to the largest audience was the best way to grow the sport. Heavy advertising by organizers helped spread the word of the tournament and it proved to be a success. Average attendance was 37,000 and over 1.2 million fans attended games a record held until the 2015 games in Canada that had over 1.3 million fans. The final between the Americans and the Chinese teams proved to be one of the largest games in women's football with 90,000 fans in the Rose Bowl in Pasadena, California. The game proved to be the spectacle that the Americans had promised. The two teams played a tight game to a 0-0 draw after extra time forcing a penalty, sh penalty shootout. The winning goal by American Brandy Chastain has become an iconic symbol of women's football as, he took, as she took off her shirt and waved it around her head before sliding on her knees in celebration. The 1999 World Cup was a turning point in women's football, particularly in the US. The fanfare of their victory was huge as it was covered by the local press. A professional women's league was started in the Women's United Soccer Association and began the growing tradition of US excellence and dominance in women's football. While the league would fold after three seasons, successor leagues, including the Women's Professional, women's professional Soccer from 2007 to 2012, 
and the National Women's Soccer League, founded in 2012, have continued to push women's football in the U.S. Other leagues grew as well. European domestic leagues have grown following the Italian example, with France starting a league in 1975, Sweden in 1988, and England in 1991. With the rise of women's leagues and talent across Europe, UEFA began a women's club competition in 2001, renaming it the Women's Champions League in 2009. One of the great success stories of women's football, thanks to their domestic work, is Japan, who started a women's league in 1988. The development of the women's game led to success at the international level, as Japan defeated the U.S. in the 2011 World Cup in Germany, winning on penalties. They then returned to the finals in the 2015 World Cup in Canada, losing to the Americans who exacted revenge for their loss. The growth of domestic leagues, though, is not easy. The example of the Americans currently on their third iteration of a professional league was seen in other countries. England underwent several versions of their current until their current league, the Women's Super League, was formed in 2010. Additionally, many of the national organizations were reluctant to capitalize on women's football and help it grow. One example is that of Denmark, who had very successful teams in the 1970s, winning several of the unofficial tournaments, including the 1979 European competition. When pushed to help grow the game and secure their place as a powerful women's footballing nation, the Danish Football Association refused to invest. They came under intense criticism both at the time and now as they squandered a chance they now regret. Women footballers have had to continue to fight for recognition from both FIFA and their own national organizations. Ex-FIFA president Sepp Blatter was criticized when in an interview in 2004, he was asked what more FIFA could do to help promote the women's, women's football. And he replied that they should wear tighter clothes and shorter shorts to make them look more feminine. He apologized after the uproar over his sexist comments, but he remained in charge of FIFA for another 11 years. The success of women footballers has also been ignored. When Cristiano Ronaldo scored his 110th and 111th international goals, he was lauded as the all-time highest goal scorer in international football. Quickly, pundits of women's football highlighted that this was incorrect, as Canadian Christine Sinclair had the most international goals, with 190. Not only that, but three other women, Abby Wambach, Maisa Jabara, and Bridget Prince have all scored more goals than Ronaldo. Critics try to defend their points by trying to state that Ronaldo played tougher opposition, ignoring the fact that any weakness in the women's game was because they were denied the same opportunities as men like Ronaldo. More recently, women's national teams have started demanding equal pay with their men male counterparts. The American team's dispute is the most well-known as they demanded equal pay during their celebrations after winning the 2019 World Cup in France. Demands for equal pay resulted in a very public legal dispute between the players and USA Soccer. Other teams have also demanded that equal pay become part of the national program, including Canada, whose team threatened to go on strike and not play at the She Believes Invitational Tournament in 2023. They played under threat of a lawsuit and under protest that saw their opponents join them in solidarity. FIFA and the national organizations have long defended the unequal pay scales as justifiable due to the larger revenue of the men's game and their World Cups that they bring in. For the upcoming World Cup, FIFA increased the amount of prize money for the women, guaranteeing that each player will walk away with a minimum of 30,000 US dollars, with 110 million dollars in total prize in the total prize pool. This is an increase of 80 million dollars from the last World Cup. However, compared to the men's tournament that was the year before, the total prize pool 
for them was $440 million. With the next iteration of the World Cup beginning in the summer of 2023, the fight for women's football continues to experience challenges and successes. The tournament being hosted by Australia and New Zealand features the largest number of teams to play in a women's tournament to date, with 32 nations. Eight of the teams are making their debut in the World Cup, highlighting the growing interest, competition, and potential for women's football. Growth of domestic leagues, particularly in Europe, where large clubs have created women's teams and have invested in the growth of these teams, has seen interest in club competitions increase. Recent attendance numbers for women's games played in the larger stadiums, largest stadiums in Europe have resulted in numbers equal to men's games, as fans have shown a keen interest in supporting the game. Government reports into the potential for the women's game have shown that it is a multi-billion dollar industry waiting to receive the growth and attention that it has lacked. The continued growth of women's football is no longer in question. It is simply now a question of how fast and how far it will go.